like to call the June 4th, 2024 meeting of the Buncombe County Commission to order. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Let's begin our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise and join us in the pledge. I'd like to read the ethics reminder to the board. <clears throat> In accordance with the code of ethics adopted by the board, all county commissioners have a duty to obey all applicable laws regarding official actions, to uphold the integrity and independence of the office, to avoid impropriety in the exercise of official duties, to faithfully perform the duties of the office, and to conduct the affairs of the governing board in an open and public manner. Is there any item on the agenda, the outcome of which would have a direct, substantial, and readily identifiable financial impact for any board member? Does any board member have a financial interest in any public contract coming before the board today? There being none, all board members have a duty and obligation to vote on any matters voted on by the county commissioners at our meeting this evening. I would also like to make an announcement that there is parking validation and bus passes for um, Commission workshops and meetings, anyone who is parking in a county parking facility or used a uh, public transit to attend this meeting can get passes from security on their way out. It's valid for today only. Commissioners, we come to the consent agenda. Are there any items on the consent agenda? Are any questions about any items on the consent agenda? Do any members of the public have any questions about any of the items on the consent agenda? <clears throat> All right. Commissioners, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. And there's also been a request that we move um, the presentation <laughs> items um, to, to go ahead and do those before the public comment. So if uh, that's acceptable, Barbara. As well as the employee recognition. As well as the employee recognition. Yes, sir. All right. I move that we amend the agenda as stated and accept the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, great. And Avril, of this, which did you want to do first? Employee recognition, sir. Okay. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, do you want to tee us off on this? Yes, sir. I'm looking for Taylor Jones, our head of emergency ma management services. As you know, located here in the West is USAR, our Urban Surge and Rescue Task Force number two. And they have had some deployments for this past fiscal year. And we'd like to recognize them for going across our state and across our country. So, Taylor, I'll hand it over to you. So, Commissioners, <clears throat> one of the things that uh, I'd like to recognize is the hard work that our county fire chiefs and the City of Asheville fire chief and how they support our team, along with Brittany Robinson, who is our division manager for emergency management, and how she works with each one of these fire chiefs to create readiness and preparedness and really coordinates on a moment's notice these deployments. You know, the recent deployment to Vermont and the recent deployment to Texas just shows the readiness and the capabilities and how sought out uh, our team is to respond and assist our neighbors. But I also want to point out how that preparedness and readiness really assist us when we have things like Tropical Storm Fred and things that happen in our own community. And as we recognize June 1st being the kick off of hurricane season, you know, being this strong with preparedness. So I'd like to thank all of my fire chief, Brittany Robinson, for the hard work that she's doing. Our team members, uh, Wallace and West and Gibby, that was deployed and is here with us tonight. I want to thank you all for all the hard work that you all did in Texas, but also thank our commissioners and our county management and leadership for all the support that you all give this team 
so that they can have the preparedness and readiness level at a moment's notice to step up and assist our citizens. But thank you all. Commissioners, you can see the fire chiefs are all here with us tonight. So I want to personally thank each one for showing up tonight and also for answering the call every single time that we reach out. So thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here. And uh, thanks for what you do for people of Buncombe County every day showing up, but also for our neighbors and people across the country in need uh, when called upon. Thank you so much. You represent us very well. Very well. We appreciate all of you. <clears throat> Okay, we have a couple of presentations. Uh, the first um, is on gun violence prevention and awareness month and County Commissioner Amanda Edwards is going to uh, read the proclamation. The County of Buncombe Proclamation, Gun Violence Prevention and Awareness Month, an NC Safe Week of Action. Whereas, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, there were more than 48,000 firearm-related deaths in the United States in 2022, according to provisional mortality data. Whereas, data indicates about 132 people die from a firearm-related injury each day, with more than half being suicides and more than four out of every 10 homicides. Whereas Americans are 26 times more likely to die by gun homicide than people in other high income countries with firearms being the leading cause of death for American children and teens with no other peer nation having firearm deaths in the top causes of mortality. Whereas in 2023, the Buncombe County Register of Deeds recorded 51 death certificates that showed someone died by a gun, and whereas 46 of those incidents occurred inside Buncombe County, with the youngest only 14 years old, while the oldest was 94 years old. Whereas communities across the nation, including Buncombe County, are working to end deaths by guns, including suicides, accidents, and gun violence with evidence-based solutions, whereas Support for the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding residents goes hand in hand with promoting gun ownership safety and keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories. Whereas all gun owners in North Carolina have a responsibility to safely store their firearms, which helps to prevent accidents as well as theft. Whereas since 2021, Buncombe County's Justice Services Department has partnered with community-based organizations to pilot community safety initiatives directed toward healing, support, practical resources, and a reduction in violence for our communities with the highest rates of gun violence. Whereas the Justice Services Department continues to partner with community-based organizations to implement a community-based public health response to violence, offering training and support for community health worker, violence prevention professionals, youth leadership development, and building a multi-sectoral coalition to prevent and respond to community violence. Whereas Buncombe County's Health and Human Services Department seeks to strengthen our community by advancing health, safety, and opportunity, preventing injury and death by promoting the health and well-being of populations through the use of data, research, and effective policies and partnerships. And whereas we recognize survivors of gun violence, honor the lives lost to gun violence in Buncombe County, commit to reducing gun violence, and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage gun owners to commit to safely storing their guns using approved measures. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners recognizes June 2nd through 8th as NC Safe Week of Action in June 2024 to be Gun Violence Prevention and Awareness Month signed by Brownie Newman, chairman of the Buncombe County Board of Commissioners. As a school gun violence survivor, this is one of the things that I'm most proud about 
Buncombe County being involved in and working to reduce gun violence deaths and injuries. And it is my pleasure to present this to our staff. And I believe Will is going to say a few words. Good evening. I just want to say um, thank you for uh, recognizing Gun Violence Awareness Month. Um, something we are actively working very hard to see a reduction in, in gun violence here in Buncombe County. We will be having a event on June 7th, this Friday from 2 to 6 p.m. Um, just around gun violence awareness, uh, targeting um, gun safety, to, uh, teaching gun safety to our youth. So if you can come out to Pack Square Park this Friday, we would love to have you out. Thank you. Next item is a state of the airport update. And Lou Blyweiss, the executive director of the Greater Asheville Regional Airport, is here to provide the update. Lou, thanks for being with us. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you for having me for my annual report. Um, it's been a good year, it's been a busy year. Uh, air service, as far as what we have for 2023, six carriers still operate at the airport Allegiant, American, Delta. JetBlue, Sun Country, and United. We had 27 nonstop destinations out of the airport in 2023. It's the most we've ever had. I'm not gonna go through all 23, but we did add three new routes last year. One was nonstop to Phoenix. Another one was nonstop to Orlando, Florida, uh, the actual Orlando International. And we added Denver on a daily nonstop flight. From a passenger perspective, we had 2,246,411 passengers go through the terminal. That's an all-time record for the, <coughs> excuse me, for the airport. It was a 22% increase over the previous year. Seats in the market was 1.3 million, which is up 23%. Load factor, which I say is butts in the seats, actually went down 1% for a total of 82%. Obviously, with that type of increase in number of seats, uh, the passengers weren't keeping up with it. From an operational perspective, we had 31,269 airline operations, which was up 16.4%. And our general aviation and military uh, was down slightly at 4.5% for 49,787 operations. The, uh, the airport continues with construction. Uh, obviously, our terminal and tower projects still go on. In 2023, we had spent $56.8 million out of a total of $420 million estimated. Uh, we added the South Shuttle parking lot for approximately $10 million, and we also did uh, finished our, uh, ma our airport master plan update, which staff from Buncombe County participated in. From a community standpoint, we did, uh, again, we had our runway 5K. We earned a net uh, revenue on that of $25,000, of which we gave uh, $10,000 to AV Tech Aviation Foundation, $10,000 to the WNC Pilots Association Foundation, and $5,000 went to a charity partner that we partner up with, which is Big Brothers Big Sisters of Western North Carolina. We continue to have music in the airport. Uh, we also did the Blue Ridge Honor Flight uh, again this past spring and last year. Pause for passengers, that's our, uh, our comfort dogs throughout the terminal building continues. And we also uh, uh, participated within our own ABO team if in our giveaway program where we contribute uh, approximately $8,000 last year to various charities throughout the community. Economic impact from the airport uh, continues to be at $2.275 billion. Uh, we are currently undergoing a new economic impact study as we speak now. From the financially, uh, from the airport perspective, we had operation revenues of $24.3 million, operating expenses of $12.9 million, leaving us a net of $12.3 million for the year. Assets at the end of 2023, $273 million, 598000 So, and that is up approximately $37 million from the previous year. Be happy to answer any questions that y'all may have about what's going on at the airport. Thank you. 
You also have co hard copy. I know you uh, electronic copies were given. We also provided hard copies of our annual uh, operations report. <laughs> All right, Lee, thanks so much. Uh, commissioners, any questions? <clears throat> Sounds like things are really hopping out there. It's, um, but you guys are doing a great job. I know <clears throat> whenever I have to go somewhere, I enjoy flying out of Asheville so much more than anywhere else. It is such a more pleasant experience than any other options. So thanks for what you do. We appreciate are you it. Flying this summer, because remember that statement. Pinch <laughs> <laughs> points may happen this summer with the amount of traffic we're expecting right. and with the tight confines under the construction. So please bear with us. Next summer, we'll have hopefully half the new terminal open with more than double the space that we currently have. So just bear with us right. this summer. Right, right, understood. All right, thanks, Lee. Thank care. you, have a good evening. <clears throat> okay, Commissioner's last presentation is the, um, from the Community Child Protection Teams, <clears throat> the Child Fatality Prevention Team Annual Report, and uh, Dr. Jennifer Mullendor is here to help us out with this item. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Good evening. So as chair of the Buncombe County Community Child Protection Team, Child Fatality Prevention Team, I'm going to cover some key points from our 2023 annual report to the board. So uh, just going to start with an overview. Uh, so the North Carolina general statute outlines what the purpose of the state's child fatality prevention system is. And uh, we assess the records of all of deaths of all children from birth to age 18 who are North Carolina residents at the time of their death. And we also look at selected cases of children who are being served by Child Protective Services. And the goals of this system and these records we use are to um, understand why children in North Carolina are dying, to look for gaps and deficiencies in service delivery, and to make and implement recommendations to help prevent future deaths. So uh, to split it up into the two teams, the Community Child Protection Team, uh, they review selected active cases of children who are being served by Child Protective Services and all cases in which a child died as a result of suspected or confirmed abuse or neglect and had a report of abuse or neglect made about the child or the family during the two DSS during the prior year or the child or the family were recipients of Child Protective Services within the prior year. And the other team, the Child Fatality Prevention Team, is tasked with reviewing the records of all other children, birth to age 18, who died from a cause other than suspected abuse or neglect. And it's always important to remember that we review deaths the year after they occurred. So in 2023 and the early months of this year, we were reviewing deaths of children who died in 2022. So I'm going to share uh, data from some of those fatality review reviews in a future in a few slides, um, and it's also common in most counties that these two teams are combined, blended into one team. <clears throat> the statute also outlines what the role of the Board of County Commissioners is related to these teams. Um, so first, you get an annual report from the team. Uh, you advocate for system improvements in need of resources if requested by the team, and you appoint members to the team as designated by state statute. And later in your meeting, there is a um, request to appoint a new representative from HelpMate due to some staff turnover there. So now I'm going to share some of the data, or the data, from the 2022 fatalities. So this provides an overview of the number of child fatalities by cause of death. And the team reviewed the deaths of 24 children who resided in Buncombe County at the time of their deaths in 2022. There were five additional child fatalities that year that have not yet been reviewed by the team per guidance from the state's child fatality prevention team program coordinator. However, the data from those deaths is included in these slides. Four of those five fatalities are in a pending status with the North Carolina Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, which means that their autopsies or toxicology have not yet been released. Once those documents are released to the team, then we will conduct our review. One other fatality is awaiting an intensive review, which is a two-day process led by a representative from North Carolina DSS. And that, again, is a child who was involved with DSS in the year prior to their death. And that review was scheduled earlier this year, but was canceled due to some 
due to some staffing inability and has not yet been rescheduled yet. And I just got permission a few weeks ago from the state coordinator to go ahead and have the team review it because the longer we wait, the less useful a review actually is. Um, the, for those uh, five unreviewed deaths, three of those were accidents, one was a suicide and one was a homicide. Um, and you can see from this slide that the predominant causes of those fatalities uh, in 2022 were illnesses, accidents, and perinatal conditions. And of note, uh, suicide was the fourth leading cause of death of children in Buncombe County in 2022. Also significant, but not shown explicitly on this slide because it's not an official cause of death, three children in Buncombe County died in 2022 as a result of maltreatment and or neglect. And accidents is a very broad category. Um, and so what these uh, accidents involved included uh, drowning deaths, uh, accidental poisonings involving fentanyl, motor vehicle crash, and an accidental fatal handgun injury due to an unsecured firearm. Um, and then both of the sudden unexplained infant deaths were categorized as having an un undetermined cause but did involve unsafe sleep environments. Um, and then regarding perinatal conditions, mostly that involved premature birth. The next slide looks at um, the trend in youth suicide in Buncombe County over the last several years. So per the North Carolina State Center for Health Statistics, there were four Buncombe County youth who died by suicide between 2017 and 2021. And then we saw a significant increase in 2022 that continued into 2023. So again, although this is a report of 2022 fatalities, because this is such a significant issue that's been affecting our community, I included data from the first six months of 2023. These are, again, fatalities that the team has already started to review. Um, and as you can see in the first six months of 2023, uh, there were three youth suicides from, su or youth fatalities from suicide. And these suicides involved, you know, youth ranging from 12 to 17, wide range. Um, and uh, so it's definitely um, something that is affecting our community and that our team has spent a lot of time discussing. When we look at the ages of the deceased children, we see that 41% of the fatalities, or 12 out of the 29, were in children less than one year of age. And that's not surprising as infants routinely comprise the largest percentage of child fatalities you know, in the world. And then when we look specifically at the causes of death of infants, again, perinatal conditions, uh, specifically prematurity is the most common um, cause of death, which is consistent to what is seen in the state and in the US as a whole. Um, because unsafe sleep is a common um, factor in infant, infant fatalities, um, I wanted again to look at the trend in infant deaths associated with unsafe sleep in Buncombe County over the last several years. Um, and so you can see it's, it hovers anywhere between one and three deaths a year. And co-sleeping has been a predominant risk factor in these fatalities in recent years. Um, this slide looks at the number of child fatalities by race and ethnicity. And um, Buncombe County, um, we know black individuals make up 6% of the Buncombe County population, yet nine out of the 29 or 31% of Buncombe County child fatalities in 2022 were in black children. And so we know that uh, child fatalities are um, disproportionately impacting the black population of Buncombe County. And we're gonna look further into that on the next slide. When we look at the infant mortality disparity ratio. So this is a, a, a ratio that the state has been tracking for years. Um, and because infant deaths are small in number, um, they look at five year increments for, the, for this calculation. And um, our public health team has followed the infant mortality disparity ratio between black and white babies for many years as part of our community health improvement process. And um, last year, you might recall, um, with the 2021 data, the North Carolina Center for Health Statistics 
added a multi-race category for death. And they basically recommended that starting with that 2021 data, you can't go back and compare because the, you're comparing apples and oranges. And so um, we can only compare from 2021 moving forward. However, with our, our data from 2017 to 2021, we had less than 10 black infants die. And so that statistic, that number becomes a little uncertain. And so they, we couldn't, um, the epidemiologist recommended that we not calculate an infant mortality ratio because of that um, small number of deaths. So I can't really compare to past, um, but we did, um, we are able to calculate for this five year period. And you can see that in Buncombe County, black infants are 2.36 times more likely to die before their first birthday than white infants. And I will say in general, um, again, knowing that we can't compare, that number has been as high as four, um, four times different um, years ago. Um, and although um, have to be cautious about the calculation for the last five year period, this, this value of 2.36 is relatively stable um, from the prior five years. And clearly a disparity um, of any size is not what we wanna see. And so efforts need to continue focused on black maternal and infant mm. health and social determinants of health and addressing racism. Um, regarding the deaths from unsafe sleep, um, you know, when each fatality is reviewed, the team is tasked by the state with determining were there any system problems and what recommendations will we make uh, to, uh, you know, pl implement programs or policy changes to prevent those, those deaths in the future. And um, infant deaths from unsafe sleep uh, is an ongoing issue. And what we often see, again, is that people were provided with education about how to prevent unsafe sleep deaths. deaths. They, they have the equipment at home. They have the bassinets and the cribs. But it's that behavior change, right? You, you're tired as a parent <clears throat> in the middle of the night. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you to stop interrupting the speaker. And if you don't, you'll be asked to leave. All right, thank you. Um, in the middle of the night, you're tired as a parent and something might happen, right? You might fall asleep with the baby in your arms on the couch or, you know, and so um, it's a really hard thing, um, uh, a hard thing to have behavior change, right? Um, and, and a difficult time as, uh, with a, as a parent. And so um, we have provided education to providers. We're, we've worked at Safe Sleep NC to provide education to providers about how to talk with families about um, safe sleep uh, recommendations and having a plan for what to do in the middle of the night. Uh, we've shared links to safe sleep videos that are posted on the Safe Sleep NC website. This is um, a screenshot from one of those videos. Again, to push out to local pediatric care providers and community partners who work with um, families uh, to you know, educate um, and answer questions that parents may have about safe sleep. Um, and we've encouraged Safe Sleep NC to continue to review the literature and see if there are other best practices that can help prevent these, these deaths. And in, uh, every year we get a small allotment of money from the state to, to use for child fatality prevention purposes. We use our fiscal year $23 to purchase pack and plays and fitted sheets for distribution to Sisters Caring for Sisters, a local community-based doula program founded by women of color for women of color, and also for our Buncombe County Nurse Family Partnership Program. Um, for addressing unsecured firearms, um, related to the um, discussion that was had earlier, um, we know that these unsecured firearms have been involved with accidental deaths and suicides that our team has reviewed. And so um, we have partnered um, with local agencies to promote the NC Safe campaign and uh, the event that is coming up on Friday. And then addressing youth suicide, um, again, this has been um, a very significant challenge for our team, um, reviewing these deaths. And so um, last year, May 2023, uh, after having um, heard of several youth suicides, we sponsored a youth suicide prevention community conversation, which pulled together representatives from a variety of community agencies that serve youth. We shared data and we got a lot of feedback um, about things to consider, um, uh, projects to implement to prevent uh, youth suicide or intervene or, or post-intervention efforts. And um, school systems, community partners, and the county staff continue to take steps to address youth mental health and suicide. Um, Montgomery County Schools has um, 
been participating in Sources of Strength, a pilot through UNC, specifically at Reynolds High and Irwin High, focused on um, it's a best practice for youth mental health promotion and suicide prevention that uses peer support networks. And so um, they're working on that. Um, we used our fiscal year 24 funds um, uh, to uh, give to our um, CAPE team to print information about the 988 um, uh, Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, push that information out to the community so people know where to turn. Um, and so uh, we have been working with partners to really move these efforts forward. VIA um, recently was awarded a grant to support work with the Buncombe County Child Collaborative, and they're going to step in and kind of take a leadership role of these efforts to coordinate um, uh, so that everybody's moving in the right direction. Um, and um, members of that collaborative and other stakeholders are going to be attending an upcoming statewide summit on suicide prevention. Any questions? I do, Dr. Molnador. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for this information. My question is about one of your earlier slides mm -hmm. regarding um, childhood deaths and their causes. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm just curious how those specific data points compare to national trends, and, I, and then I guess just the overall quantity of of child fatalities. How does that compare to, to other, count, other peer counties? I guess. Um, so it's hard to know, honestly, because we don't really get data from other, for other counties, so I'd have to go to the North Carolina Center for Health Statistics and see. Um, I mean, clearly, rural counties may have zero youth fatalities, right? Yeah. Um, whereas counties like Mecklenburg and Wake have significant not more, significantly more than we do. Um, I would say that our, you know, over the years that I've been involved, the number has, you know, we, we rarely break over 30. Um, but we're, we tend to be in the 20s, uh, high 20s annually. Or annually. Um, and the causes of death, again, relatively similar. Uh, the CDC did recently publish a report about drownings increasing since the pandemic. And we have, again, had seen, we've had two drowning fatalities recently. Some of that is thought related to um, maybe during the pandemic, people weren't getting swim lessons, right? And so it's really important for young children um, to get swim lessons. Uh, so I, I think we're pretty consistent um, with with what what is being seen across the state and in the U.S. Any other questions? All right, thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Dr. Molinar. All right, we now come to public comment. <clears throat> uh, let me read the. Uh, policies on public comment. The time limit for individuals to comment to the board is three minutes. We'll ask everyone to come up to the podium who wishes to address the board. Um, and um, when you've got about 30 seconds left, you're, there's going to be an orange light that goes off, and then when the, your three minutes is up, there'll be a red light that goes off, and there'll be a little noise. And we do ask that folks discontinue their public comments once time's up. We want to give everyone um, the same amount of time to speak. There's a list of folks that have signed up, <clears throat> so I will go through the list. And um, we do limit public comment to a total of one hour. If we're not, um, if we're through with the list of folks that have signed up within the hour, if there's anyone else who wants to speak, they'll be invited to speak as well if there's is still additional time. Uh, but there are a lot of folks that have signed up, so I'm not sure if we're going to um, get through that or not, but we'll see. Um, all right, so Ken Khan, it's Ken Khan here. I think there's folks in the overflow room as well. So, so. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ken Khan. I'm a member of Town Council of Woodfin also on the planning board for the county. Uh, I'm really here today not in any official capacity except as a team member of the group in Woodfin that's working on the Greenway, Blue Way, and Wave project. And uh, I'll be brief. On behalf of the, the town and our the town management, 
and the town council members. I wanted to thank the county the commissioners, the town, ma the county manager, for your support, for your partnership. This is a, in some ways, a magical project that not only acknowledges the needs of our current residents, but thinks ahead to the future generations. And for that, we are very grateful for your help. Um, I will probably not be the person if you have questions when it gets to that, but my council colleague, Eric Edgerton, is in the overflow room, and I'm sure he'll be delighted to come into the main uh, room if there are questions. But that's it. Thank you very much on behalf of all of us. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I also mentioned, I men mentioned, I apologize in advance for mispronouncing anyone's name. Um, Amy Alday, is Amy Alday in this room? All right, great. Good evening. Um, my name is Amy Alday, and I'm standing here today on my own behalf as a long-term resident of the city of Asheville, a Buncombe County and Asheville city taxpayer, a parent of school-aged children, and a school health nurse of 18 years. I have devoted my career as a registered nurse to the public health and safety of children within the public schools of Buncombe County. I've worked within Buncombe County Schools, Asheville City Schools, and currently at Francine Delaney New School for Children and Evergreen Community Charter School. I'm speaking today to advocate for Bun Buncombe County to continue to support school health services for the students and families within our public charter schools. This is a plea for the charter schools communities that have been provided these necessary school health services over the past three to seven years and are now abruptly going to be left without, leaving over a thousand students without health at their health and safety at risk. Over the last week alone, I provided care to a student that nearly severed the end of his finger during a school activity, resulting in shock-like symptoms and needing emergency medical treatment. On the following day at my other school, I was able to identify a student that was experiencing a severe cardiac event. This student has been reporting chest pains previously, was seen by his primary provider without any official diagnosis. Because a registered school health nurse was present on campus during this cardiac event, he received the necessary emergency medical care needed and has now been diagnosed with a congenital heart defect and will be going, undergoing surgery to correct. These are just two of the examples from the last week of why it, how imperative it is for Buncombe County to continue to support public charter schools with school health services. As a parent of children who attend both Asheville City Schools and a Buncombe County Charter School, how is it being decided that one of my children is more deserving of this essential public health service than the other just because of the public school that they attend? School health nursing is the heart of public health within our school communities. I urge you to work with Buncombe County Health and Human Services to reconsider the decision to decrease the school health program by these two vital positions and continue to support the public health and safety of all students and families within our county. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'd like to, um, I'd like to ask that uh, folks not uh, applaud or express disapproval of any of the speakers when they speak. We want everyone to be able to speak um, and say what they're here to share with us and the community uh, without, you know, kind of uh, commentary on what people think about it. All right, uh, the next person that signed up is Gary Turak. Hi, thank you as leaders of Asheville. I know there's an enormous amount on your plate that you do and I'm just grateful as leaders that you take the time to hear from the public and appreciate what you do for our city. The topic tonight, 5G, I'm aware. You've probably been hearing about the topic since 2018, maybe even prior. Um, and the fact that you're open to hearing some new information related I think is important. I understand making a lot of decisions, the prioritization of them. I'm an organ I founded an organization myself that is now 2,000 people. We train 200,000 leaders across the country one out of every five colleges in the US. So I've spent uh, an hour with the Dalai Lama, I've worked with uh, President Obama, Clinton and Bush and so on. This though is a local issue for me because I'm a parent of three, I live in Asheville and I decided to dive in and take a look at the actual research. Is this harmful, is this not? I was hoping it wouldn't be. Unfortunately, the science shows 
uh, I'm a Cornell University graduate. I can get into MENS if I wanted. And I realized, though, looking at the research, you don't need to be a genius. Any relatively intelligent person, like it yourself, if you look at the research, you would actually see how black and white it is as to how toxic it is. If you ask, uh, um, is global warming, you know, does, is it true? You'd hear, yes, it's true from the scientists. If you ask, is EMF and 5G absolutely toxic to the human body and just create cellular damage and damage to the DNA and so on, does it create cancer? Absolutely, if you actually look at the science. I realize you're busy and there's so much on your plate. My plea tonight is to just see the research as to what it's gonna do to us if this continues um, down this path of continuing to expand 5G. I mean, who did this? Who looked at the research? A couple of cities that were great, like us. Um, cities like Eaton, um, Easton and uh, Stanford in Connecticut both said, let's look at this topic and look at the research. They brought in the scientists and the city councils decided in both cities not to move forward with 5G after hearing the actual science. Um, countries are um, on this bandwagon now to France, Belgium, Israel, Spain, Australia, Italy. They're all limiting and completely banning Wi-Fi in schools because of the impact on the human body. And there's so many peer-reviewed studies. Yale just did one last year showing EMFs, 5G, that type of substance, the electromagnetic frequency, creates cancer. At the cellular level, the radiation from EMFs is shown to cause oxidative stress, DNA damage, and that's the backbone of all health problems. So a really well-known on the credibility side um, epidemiologist, a former advisor to the WHO, World Health Organization, Dr. Anthony Miller, uh, he had an expert panel come together to take a look at the research, and what they concluded was that, and this blew me away, that um, EMF and RF are, should be classified as asbestos and tobacco. These are the experts looking at the data. So again, my plea is if we can just, I know Rory, uh, I'm sorry, Roy Cooper wants to increase um, internet in the state of North Carolina. If we go the route of this, it's gonna be toxic for ourselves and our children. And it will, we might be down the path a certain way, deals may have been made. If you need to do something to reverse it, like raise a million dollars, I'm happy to help. I'd love to help in whatever way I can. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Joseph Alder. Hi, my name is Joseph, and I'm here with others to speak about a very important subject, 5G and EMF, AKA electromagnetic field, microwave and trespassing technology, and smart technology. Currently, there is this perception that more is better, that more Wi-Fi, more access to the internet, more technology that surveys the private lives of people is better. But better for whom? The reality is that the greater the technology, the greater the need for understanding the impact and ramifications of that technology on overall health. Currently, we have big tech rolling out all this new smart technology with very little to zero testing to see whether such technology causes harm to living beings. However, there are other institutions that have done the research and the research is clear. The frequencies of the current and future technology being considered is toxic to the human body and all living beings. These technologies are marketed as a great advance for our civilization, but how advanced will such a civilization be if everyone is sick? Whether it is an acute or chronic illness, we need to address this situation now before it gets out of hand. The tech industry has many lobbyists and currently there are many bills in Congress and the Senate that takes the power away from the cities and towns, giving carte blanche to these industries to do whatever they wish, putting up cell towers and devices anywhere and everywhere, every 500 feet in the name of smart technology and the greater capacity to be connected to Wi-Fi and the internet no matter where you are. Alongside this capacity is the freedom from liability for all and any harm done that by these towers and devices. Now, I don't know how this is even a possibility that we, the people, have no say in what, where these corporations with the history of causing harm have so much power that they can do whatever they wish because a supposed law has been passed, deeming that they have all the power. And on top of that, that they are immune to liability for any harm that their technology causes. How is it that we have gotten to this place where corporations have all the power and we, the people, have none? I and others are here today to say that this 5G smart technology cannot move forward, that there is a plethora of proof that these microwaves cause serious harm 
from anxiety to depression to mental fatigue to addiction and to many types of cancer. We are here today to demonstrate how this smart technology 5G with its emissions of microwaves and EMF is a bane to human existence and to all living things. It is our hope that your eyes can hear and that your, that your ears can hear and that your eyes can see the dangers of such technology. And I'm gonna leave with you a pamphlet with all the information, thank you. Natalie Martin. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for receiving this information we're sharing with you. I know that it's a lot. Cities throughout the world, even entire countries, have restricted or suspended their 5G rollout so they can investigate health and safety impacts first. As Gary mentioned, several countries have laws banning and restricting Wi-Fi in schools, banning cell towers on school grounds, and labeling cell phones for radiation levels as warnings to consumers. Hundreds of scientists have written to the United Nations, European Union, World Health Organization, Council of Europe, and governments of all nations calling for a halt to 5G. The FCC guidelines on cell phones and wireless radiation were established in 1996 and have never been updated. Insurance companies define cell phone radiation as a pollutant and refuse to insure cell tower manufacturers against damages from cell phones, devices, towers, and antennas. Around the world, policymakers are taking action on the issue of cell phones, wireless, and 5G. For example, New Hampshire has a 5G bill that states, thousands of peer-reviewed studies, including the recently published US Toxicology Program's 16-year, $30 million study, are showing a wide range of statistically significant DNA damage, brain and heart tumors, infertility, and so many other ailments. Why is this being ignored by the FCC? More than 220 of the world's leading scientists have signed an appeal to the WHO and the UN to protect public health from wireless radiation, and nothing has been done. The scientific 5G appeal to the European Union is signed by more than 400 doctors, professors, scientists, and elected officials from Argentina, Austria, Australia, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, China, Egypt, France, India, Japan, Sweden, Switzerland, Turkey, the UK, the US, and more. It states, we, the undersigned scientists, recommend a moratorium on the rollout of 5G until potential hazards for human health and the environment have been fully investigated by scientists independent from industry. 5G substantially increases exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields. Effects include increased cancer risk, cellular stress, increase in harmful free radicals, genetic damages, structural and functional changes of the reproductive system, learning and memory deficits, neurological disorders, and negative impacts on general well-being in those of mankind. Thank you. Jamie Nix. I'm here to share information about trespassing technology. Many utilities are installing or have installed smart meters, smart or advanced digital electricity and or gas and or water meters and related network technologies which do the following. One, record and transmit data for the purpose of surveillance of personal activities in private dwellings, workplaces and schools of men, women and children without disclosure or consent. Two, emit radio frequencies including but not limited to microwave frequencies and pulse microwave frequencies harmful to biological organisms and or emit waste electricity in the form of voltage transients, also known as dirty electricity, which is also harmful to biological organisms. And three, cause uh, fires, security vulnerabilities, and facilitate erroneously high utility bills. Trespassing technology and related infrastructure is deployed at or near the dwellings and workplaces and schools of men, women, and children without first acquiring their explicit consent. Trespassing technology is designed with the capability and intention to extract data from within private dwellings and workplaces and schools of men, women, and children about specific information pertaining to activities therein. A United States Congressional Research Report titled Smart Meter Data, Privacy, and Cybersecurity from February 3rd, 2012 states, 
With smart meters, police will have access to data that might be used to track residents' daily lives and routines while in their homes, including their eating, sleeping, and showering habits, all appliances they use and when, and whether they prefer the television to the treadmill, amongst a host of other details. Miles uh, Keogh, a senior official with National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissions, uh, stated in an interview with Politico on January 1st, 2015, I think the data is going to be worth a lot more than the commodity that's been consumed to generate the data. Anzo Limited um, of the UK released an animated video in 2016 which stated, we use this characterized profile to give the utility the ability to monetize their customer data by providing a direct link to appropriate third party organizations based on the customer's identified character. Thank you. Andrew Abardo. Hi, my name is uh, Andrew and I appreciate the opportunity to address you today. I want to speak to you about the global push to implement 5G technology, which aims to connect everyone and everything through various forms of electromagnetic radiation. This technology is designed to link all infrastructure, devices, and even living beings into a vast network known as Internet of Things and the Internet of Bodies. The goal appears to create a complex web of connectivity and artificial intelligence that spans the entire planet. While the promise of such advanced connectivity might seem appealing, there are grave concerns that need your attention. This agenda seems to be paving the way for worldwide governance through a smart grid extending beyond smart cities. More elements have been subtly integrated into our daily lives through everyday items such as food, water, and household products. These elements make us more susceptible to the harmful radiation which are infiltrating our homes, workplaces, and schools. The inconsistency in the development of 5G antennas, which are required every 500 feet in residential areas due to the short travel distance of 5G millimeter waves, raises questions. How can these short range waves necessitate over 65,000 satellites in space? This discrepancy suggests that 5G could be more than just a communication network. It might be a weaponized system. Scientific research has long documented the harmful effects of radiation similar to that used in 5G technology. For over a century, thousands of studies founded by various institutions have indicated potential risks to human health. By the mid-1960s, the evidence was compelling enough for Congress to amend the Public Health Service Act, mandating protection against electronic radiation dangers. Yet despite accumulating more studies, this, consistent, uh, this, this consensus has eroded over time. In 1991, the FCC established guidelines for radiation exposure based on a mere 120 studies, contradicting a two-year IEEE study that suggested otherwise. This discrepancy points to the possible fraud in the formation of these guidelines, leaving the public vulnerable to the dangers of 5G. I urge you to consider these concerns carefully. Our health and safety should be paramount as we navigate the implementation of new, to, of, of new technology. Thank you for your time and attention. It was a critical matter. Thank you. Red Acosta. Greetings. My name is Red, and I'm speaking to you today as a parent, concerned not only for my own well-being and my loved ones, but for you and yours. Many years ago, nobody thought twice about living in a home with asbestos, but now we know better. The disastrous effects that 5G has on all life is at least on par with the dangers of asbestos, if not far, far beyond. The 5G network is intended to exceed the radiation levels of all previous networks combined, and to cause the inundation of this radiation into our bodies as well as our homes, our workplaces, public spaces, and schools, where none of us can avoid exposure and without our consent. This is all despite established scientific evidence that our bodies are optimal absorbers for this radiation and are unquestionably harmed by it. In an October 16, 2014, United States Department of Defense unclassified document, it states, quote, the National Security Agency confirms a high-powered microwave system weapon that may have the ability to weaken, intimidate, or kill an enemy over time and without leaving evidence, 
and that this weapon is designed to bathe a target's living quarters in microwaves, causing numerous physical effects, including a damaged nervous system, end quote. We are already seeing an abundance of evidence of these 5G microwaves causing harm to nervous systems. We know that various financial interests have paid to influence federal, state, and local governments to enact laws requiring the, con the construction and operation of 5G and other wireless deployments and are aware of the resulting potential for total surveillance, weather modification, and other weaponized usages. The FCC, through the use of FCC rules, is attempting to circumvent the law of this land by preventing state and local government interference on 5G deployment. This alone is a flagrant violation of existing law established to protect we the people, excuse me, including but not limited to the Constitution of the United States of America. And the docket numbers for these FCC rules are documented in the information that we'll be leaving with you. And it is the responsibility of each and every one of us to take a stand for the integrity of governance where we live in service to the health and well-being of current and future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Ian D. Locke. County Commissioners, I'm Andy, and I want to share some truths with you. The truth is that consent is lawfully required for installation of any surveillance device or any device that collects and transmits private personal data to undisclosed unauthorized parties for undisclosed unauthorized purposes. That truth, the truth is that men, women, and children in private dwellings, workplaces, and schools are not informed that these properties may be used as relay stations for networks related to trespassing technology, nor are they justly compensated. The truth is that trespassing technology creates a previously non-existent vulnerability and it diminishes private dwelling, workplace, and school security by functioning as a wireless digital gateway in, in an indoor space. The truth is that close, close proximity antennas are the most pervasive of the ground-based antennas which are placed close to or directly upon homes and other occupied spaces. They operate as part of larger networks and systems for a purpose of, number one, biometric scanning, collecting, and exploiting of the faces, emotions, ears, body shapes, health, organs, skeletons, skin, gates, typing and texting patterns, speech, voices, also the body odor of men, women, and children, and the skin, movement patterns, and behaviors of animals. Number two, data tracking data tracking because they are surveillance devices surveilling from the outside to the inside of all buildings. The truth is that trespassing technology does cause home fires which have resulted in the deaths of men and women in California, Texas, and Nevada. The truth is that the so-called wildfires in California 2017 to 19 and South Korea April 2019 occurred within 24 hours after 5G wireless had been activated in those regions. The truth is that there is evidence of birds and bees instantly dying en masse in numerous places across the earth when they were close to the wireless energy grid and in particular the 5G infrastructure. The truth is that cancer clusters have been found near cell towers, including in Brazil, San Diego State University, Bristol, England, and Weston Elementary School in Ripon, California, where Sprint then had to shut off the tower. The truth is, is, is that only real medical conditions are insurance reimbursable under the 2020 ICD-10 Diagnosis Code. This includes what we are discussing here today, electrosensitivity and microwave sickness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brad Jordan.
Thank you. 5G is destroying the fabric of life itself, rearranging the structure of atoms and molecules. 5G microwaves are changing the rotational, vibrational, and electronic valence configuration of atoms and molecules. What does that mean? It means it's splitting the oxygen molecules in half, making them useless for breathing. It also appears there is an agenda for false information deceiving unsuspecting utility owners, employees, government officials, lawmakers, and public health officials. There are over 5,000 patents on advanced clean energy technologies being suppressed under the guise of national security. Free, point, free zero point energy, for example, could replace the entire current energy grid, which emits waste electricity, also known as dirty electricity, which is harmful to biological organisms. The 5G AI controlled internet of things, internet of bodies, violates our constitutional amendments four, nine, 10, and 14, robbing us of our privacy, our health, and the very oxygen we breathe. The telecommunications companies deploying 5G should be required to post a bond for the many inevitable harms to human, plant, and animal life it will and is already harming. Under tort law, we are entitled to compensation for the damage being done to our health and the planet. Any man, woman, or person with full knowledge of potential harm has a duty to act in a way that avoids or mitigates harm. If he fails to do so, he is liable for the harm and may be found negligent where there is a duty of care. It is a fundamental principle of law that no one is above the law, including government actors. Any government immunity clause only applies to government actors performing actions of their office in good faith. There are many court rulings regarding public officials being held liable for their actions or failure to perform required actions, including Millbrook versus United States, Schuer versus Rhodes, and, I, and ex parte Young. And I myself am a living example of radiation poisoning. I have tingling sensations that go up and down my body. It feels like I'm being electrocuted from the inside out. It doesn't feel good. So maybe think of that before, you know, your cronies decide to uh, pass 5G. Uh, Anthony Pena. My name's Anthony. I'm going to touch on some uh, regulatory framework. The federal government may not compel the states to enact or administer a federal regulatory program to wit. John G. Roberts, Jr., Chief Justice of the United States, in his opinion to the National Federation of Independent Business versus Sebelius 567 U.S. 519, this case is in 2012, begin, quote, the legitimacy of Congress's exercise of the spending power thus rests on whether the state voluntarily and knowingly accepts the terms of the contract, quoting Pennhurst State School and Hospital versus Halderman. Respecting this limitation is critical to ensuring that spending clause legislation does not undermine the status of the states as independent sovereigns in our federal system. That system rests on what might at first seem as, as a counterintuitive insight that freedom is enhanced by the creation of two governments, not one, quoting Bond v. United States. For this reason, the Constitution has never been understood to confer upon Congress the ability to require the states to govern according to Congress instructions, quoting New York v. United States. Otherwise, the two-government system established by the framers would give away to a system that vests power in one central government and individual liberty would suffer. Any, end quote. Any and all so-called laws passed that could be used to harm the American people are void ab initio and their making is treasonous. The Supreme Court has consistently held that the federal government cannot commandeer state and local resources for its own purposes. And under the anti-commandeering doctrine, states are sovereign entities that can direct their resources as they see fit. The anti-commandeering doctrine is based primarily on five Supreme Court cases dating back to 1842, 
Prince, P-R-I-N-T-Z, V-U-S, serves as the cornerstone, can be found at www.law.cornell.edu backslash constitution hyphen Conan backslash amendment hyphen 10 backslash anti hyphen commandeering hyphen doctrine. Quoting, we held in New York that Congress cannot compel the states to enact or enforce a federal regulatory program. Today we hold that Congress cannot circumvent that prohibition by conscripting the state's officers directly. The federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems, nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. It matters not whether policymaking is involved and no case-by-case -case weighing of the burdens or benefits is necessary. Such commands are fundamentally incompatible with our constitutional system of dual sovereignty. Hence, the idea that we, are he that we here in Buncombe County have no power to reject or recourse to resist the unjust laws of the federal government are completely erroneous. Many blessings. Amanda Seta. Um, can I also ask, how many folks are in the uh, overflow room? Okay, thanks. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Amanda Seta. Across the states, local governments are taking action to protect their communities from the unfettered deployment of 4G and 5G small cell, tower, small cell wireless facilities. These pioneering cities are passing ordinances and resolutions that strictly limit the build out and calling for local control and placement of 5G and small cell towers as federal FCC and 5G streamlining laws have attempted to strip their local authority. In Greendale, Wisconsin, a resolution was passed referring to the FCC's actions as an unprecedented attack on local control, which threatened the village of Greendale's responsibility to protect the health, safety, and welfare of its residents. In 2020, the New Hampshire Commission to study the environmental and health effects of evolving 5G technology released its final report with 15 recommendations to reduce public exposure, increase transparency, and strengthen federal regulation. The 5G report recommends that U.S. federal agencies coordinate to protect the people, the wildlife, and the environment from harmful levels of radiation and states that until there is federal action, New Hampshire should take the initiative to protect its environment, and so should we. In Farragut, Tennessee, the City Council approved a resolution in May 2020 calling the state and federal governments to halt 5G until the health risks are evaluated by sound science. The resolution details how FCC limits are way outdated and considered inadequate to protect human health. In July 2020, the Hawaii County Council voted to halt 5G developments on the Big Island until 5G is proven safe. After hearing hours of public testimony decrying the health risks of this technology, the council voted eight to one to approve a resolution calling for the telecommunication companies and public utilities companies in Hawaii County to halt any 5G development until independent research and testing concludes it is safe for humans. The town of Easton, Connecticut has decided to stop its 5G rollout. Until research and testing prove it is safe, a 5G cease and desist resolution was unanimously approved by the town. The American Academy of Pediatrics and hundreds of medical and scientific experts have advised the FCC to test the long-term safety of 5G technology. I want to emphasize that like these other cities, we have the power and authority and responsibility to do the same here in Asheville. Thank you each for doing your job to protect us and keep us safe. Sunil Patel. Thank you for having us today. Um, 
In California, uh, fire stations lobbied to be exempt from having to install 5G and cell antennas on their fire stations after strong lobbying by firefighters to protect their health as previous investigations found brain damage from cell towers on fire stations. Resolutions in Oak Brook, Illinois and the city of Jersey City both call for local control. The Hallandale Beach, Florida resolution urges the federal government to initiate independent health studies on 5G. The Carmel City, Indiana Council approved a resolution asking state lawmakers, the Federal Communications Commission, and Congress to limit 5G te technology deployment in Indiana until the health effects are fully understood. The Monmouth County, New Jersey Board of Commissioners passed a resolution that supports towns in the fight against telecommunication companies erecting 5G monopolies and other concerning telecommunication services. Other communities that have passed ordinances to restrict cell antennas near homes and schools include numerous cities in California. Over 600 cities in Italy have passed resolutions to halt 5G, as have cities throughout Europe. Bermuda has halted 5G pending a report on safety and hosted a 2020 consultation. Switzerland's report on 5G health effects resulted in the parliament's refusal to loosen the radiation limits despite heavy industry lobbying efforts. The Netherlands issued a 5G report that recommended measuring radiation levels and also recommended against using 26 gigahertz frequency band for 5G for as long as the potential health risks have not been investigated. There are many, many more examples of states, towns, cities, and counties who have taken a stand against the telecommunication companies and put a stop to 5G, wireless towers, trespassing technology, and smart cities. And if all of these other places can do this, so can we. We here in Buncombe County can take steps and precautions to protect the men and women, children, and all living beings from the harm and dangers of wireless technology by putting a stop to 5G. For once, the truth is known about the dangers of 5G and wireless technology. Many more people will, ri will rise up and say no to this supposed convenience. I thank you all so much for listening and uh, we, we would love to find transparency on where power lies in preventing these types of technologies from entering our county. Um, and uh, thank you. Kelly Stevenson. Hi, County Commissioners. I am a employee of Evergreen Community Charter School. And I'm here tonight to urge you to continue to fund school nurses for public charter schools in Buncombe County. As charters, we are already at a disadvantage. Evergreen does have a school nurse, but we, she splits her job between our school and Francine Delaney, so she's already not there every day of the week. The school nurse is essential to our school's 444 students, as well as the students of other charter schools in Buncombe County. Evergreen was recently awarded the North Carolina ESEA Distinguished Schools Recognition for Excellence in Special Populations of Students with Disabilities. Students with disabilities or special health care needs often require specialized support at school. Our school nurse coordinates with teachers, parents, and health care providers to develop individualized health care plans and ensure that these students receive appropriate care and accommodations. Currently at Evergreen, our students with special needs include type 1 diabetes, epilepsy, Down syndrome, and life-threatening allergies. Without a school nurse, we simply don't have the capacity at our school to care for these students. As Nurse Amy Alday said earlier tonight, the student who had a chronic heart condition on last Friday, the seven-year-old student, had gone to the office three different times when a school nurse wasn't there and it wasn't diagnosed. Overall, the presence of our school nurse is essential for the, hundred, for the thousands of Buncombe County residences who attend charter schools by promoting their health, safety, and well-being and creating a supportive and conducive learning environment. I implore you to continue to fund this invaluable position. Thank you so much.
Jeff Smith. I'm um, sorry. Um, so call him Jeff Smith. Jeff Schmidt. Jeff. Good afternoon, um, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I am here um, as a scientist. My name is Dr. Jeff Schmidt, and um, I encourage you to exert your authority to not allow Buncombe County to become complicit in what is one of, what will be considered one of the great um, miscarriages of public health policy in American history. And um, that miscarriage is the unabated rollout of 5G and smart technology. And I say this with great certainty um, from the platform of being an Oxford trained biophysicist where I actually studied one of the uh, one of the biological systems that is most deeply impacted by uh, 5G. And also I spent the bulk of my career as a uh, professor, a full professor in three departments at Wake Forest uh, University School of Medicine. I am a um, former New York Academy of Sciences member as well as, as the head of um, research at the Integrated Medicine um, Institute at Wake Forest University. And I've spent basically my life studying the interaction of um, electromagnetic energy with biological systems. And I am here to say, as a scientist, as a practicing scientist who's worked in this domain, that there is literally an airplane hangar full of strong evidence that everything about the electromagnetic signature and energies that are, that are in the 5G rollout is detrimental to human health from D causing DNA damage to increase um, neurological problems to uh, cancer and oxidative, um, oxidative risk-based um, pathologies. So I urge you, please, to um, do whatever it takes to come to a completed point of view about the, the um, literal mountain of science that argues that this uh, new technology is absolutely detrimental to human health. Thank you very much. Das Smith, sorry, maybe I'm pronouncing this wrong. Das Smith or J, last name Smith. Anyone? Joy. Thank you. Yep. So you've heard about the various ways in which 5G harms. You probably know that they want to make Asheville into a smart city, which means uh, spreading putting all sorts of things from street lights to smart meters in our, in our county. So, and you've also heard that some cities and counties have come together to say no to this technology. I speak to you today as fellow members of this community who chose to take on the responsibility to serve, protect, and govern the people of Buncombe County. I'm part of, we, of the Buncombe County Committee of Safety and have assembled here as a lawful body politic in order to uphold our unalienable rights <coughs> and provide the welfare of Buncombe, provide for the welfare of Buncombe inhabitants. We fulfill our civic duty here today by coming in peace to petition you our civil servants for a redress of grievances. We need you as our commissioners, as our representatives, as our neighbors, to commit yourself to serve the people of Buncombe County and of Buncombe County <laughs> in all the decisions you make. Unfortunately, we find much that our state of our count of our government has gotten influenced by corporate greed and corporate interests. No, other, no, no matter what level you know this on or not, we have come to a crossroads. When you truly honor your oath of service, of office, you will let every decision you make be guided by this simple question. 
do I choose the most beneficial actions for the protection and well-being of the next seven generations of all that live here in Buncombe County? We prevent you, present you with a choice. Will you take a stand with us to guarantee the welfare of our community? Or will you follow current norms that line the pocket of greedy corporations? If you choose to serve the corporate interests at the expense of the people or turn a blind eye on to ongoing harm done by the, to the inhabitants of this fine country from a rollout of 5G and smart technology, we feel duty bound to make known the truth of the effect of this technology and that the people of Buncombe County will hold each of our public servants accountable for the decisions they make. Okay, thank you for your time. Thank you for thank your you. time. Brady Rockford. Hello, thank you for hearing from me tonight. I'm here to ask you that you do not cut funding for our school nurses. I'm a teacher at Francine Delaney. I've been an educator that for 25 years in our state and I love my job. But one thing that makes it very hard to be a teacher today in a state that has a teacher shortage is when funding is cut for programs that are invaluable to the lives of our children. And our <coughs> school nurse is an invaluable asset. Um, she plays an important role in managing not only acute care, but chronic care. According to the CDC, in the United States today, almost half of all school-aged children have a chronic illness. School health professionals, like our school nurse, may be the first to identify these con conditions in routine health examinations. The CDC also reports that school nurses save our community money by reducing costs from, em from emergency room visits and parents missing work to care for sick children. School health professionals allow educators like me to focus on teaching and students to access learning. As an educator, I'm not trained to comb through medical files and determine when a child might need to see a physician. I'm not trained to identify or understand their prescription plans or decide when one should be created. This is the expertise of a school nurse. They allow educators like me to teach. Relying on teachers or administrators and other non-nurses to provide medical care to students means that education dollars are, being subs are subsidizing health care in our school. We already exist in an underfunded and undervalued system. According to the North Carolina Program Evaluation Division, our state spent around $15 million to simply provide students with their meds. A shortage of school nurses shortchanges education and public health. Please use your influence to see that the Buncombe County Health and Human Services continue our service for our children's health. Thank you. Melissa Murphy. Hi, I'm Melissa Murphy. I've been teaching in public schools for 28 years, 22 of those in this county. I'm a member of District 3, this county commission. My husband and I have taught or our children and or our children have attended Asheville City Schools, Buncombe County Schools, and our local charter schools. I currently work at Oakley Elementary, but I'm also here to talk about the importance of making sure our local charter schools keep this crucial funding. In my 28-year career, I have worked at schools with full-time nurses, I have worked at schools with part-time nurses, and I've worked at schools with no nurses, and everything you've heard tonight is true. If we did not learn in the pandemic, I, I, hopefully we have learned from the teaching through the pandemic that our schools are part of our frontline workers. Our schools provide vital services that our children need. We need our counselors, we need our social workers, we need our school nurses. I'm particularly speaking as a parent tonight because on February 27, 2020, my 11 year old was in Mission Hospital. You go back and think about the timeline, that's within two weeks of when our nation shut down. She got the last pediatric bed at Mission. She'd been exhibiting some weird symptoms for a little while, and if anyone in here knows as a parent, 
you're always guessing, do I take him to the doctor? No, she seems okay, I'm going to wait it out. Well, it just so happens that it happened to be the day Nurse Amy Alday was on campus, and I snagged her, and I said, hey, this and this is happening, and it's weird. She's still here. She's doing her sports, but this is weird. Nurse Amy said, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? I answered yes to those things, and she said, I don't mean to alarm you, but you need to take her today to be tested for type 1 diabetes. We got the last pediatric bed admission that night. If a nurse Amy had not been there that day, I might have kept right on waiting and not seen a medical person until the next week when nurse Amy was back because it wasn't that, didn't seem that acute, and I'll always regret that, and our nurse might have saved my daughter's life. So please consider my personal story today of how crucial school nurses are. I know our state needs to be funding our school nurses full-time in every single public school. And I know y'all don't have that authority, but you do have the influence over the Buncombe County Health and Human Services to hopefully keep the funding in place for these nurses that work in our charter schools. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Sarah Burroughs. Debbie Cottle from Francine Delaney. My name is Debbie Cottle, and I am a staff member at Francine Delaney right now, but I've also been a parent in the past, have grown children now. I cannot begin to tell you how important our school nurse is to our community. She has been a vital part of staff trainings. She's helped parents with their children's health, health issues, keeps us up to date on crucial health news, and is always part of our support system with students. Just last week, we had a serious issue arise, which we've been talking about already, with one of our students. <clears throat> Luckily, um, our nurse was there, and we were able to get treatment needed and to help stabilize the student. I happened to be in the room at the same time that all this was going on with the nurse. And had she not been there and let me know the significance of this, we would, we would not have known when to um, call 911. Um, we always count on her to help guide us to know how to handle our students' health issues. And if we were to lose our school nurse, we would fill a big void in our community. There would be no one to call or to email to to talk about or to discuss how to handle certain health issues. I feel like this is an injustice and unfair to our families and to our staff, and I would like you guys to consider this. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble reading this name. It's from a Francine Delaney person. It starts with a B, I think. Come on up, it's okay. I'm back again. Thanks for listening. My name is Buffy Fowler. I'm from Francine Delaney New School for Children. I'm the operations coordinator. And the event that everyone has been talking about tonight with one of our students um, was something that I learned this week called Wolf Parkinson's White Syndrome. And I learned about it after this rare heart uh, condition caused a cardiac emergency in one of my students. Our school nurse immediately recognized, as you've heard already, 911 was contacted. The student spent the night in the hospital, and that student is scheduled to have surgery this summer, heart surgery. Um, this is just one example of why removing school nurses from students in Buckland County is not a good idea. I'm present again tonight to ask you to consider finding a way for the two school nurses positions to continue serving over a hundred, I mean over a thousand, Buncombe County students attending charter schools, which are North Carolina public schools. How can we tell over 1,005 to 14 year olds 
that are Buncombe County residents that they are not as deserving of these crucial health services as other students in Buncombe County schools and Asheville City schools. From the information I've learned, every department was asked to cut funding to make up for the funding cliff made by sales tax loss. The Department of Health and Human Services decided they would make a cut by cutting the critical resource to the four Buncombe County Charter Schools that serve over a thousand students. The proposed budget, budget raised, actually raised the amount paid to MAHEC, but still cut two positions from MAHEC, which are the two charter school positions. As an administrator of one of these charter schools, it was very frustrating to learn of this information that our school nurse was gonna be cut without time to seek additional funding. There was no discussion about whether or not we could work together or negotiate costs. We were simply told that our contracts would not be renewed. What would it take to negotiate or rethink this decision? I plead for you to amend the budget and restore the school nurses in the Buncombe County Charter Schools. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, the last person that signed up is Grayson Porter. try to go quick. Um, I'm a 5G refugee. I'm coming to you from Fort Myers, Florida. And I don't, it's hard to know exactly where to start. I've been fighting 5G and other electromagnetic radiation technologies since 2014. Um, so let me do some quick fundamentals. There's a lot of tactics that the utilities and the telecommunications companies use. The first one I want to get rid of is broadband versus wireless. When you're reading their proposals and you're looking at the funding things from the community development block grants, take a look at whether they're calling it broadband wireless or wireless or broadband wired. Broadband is wired. Wireless is wireless. And about five years ago, the lobbyists and the, those with vested interests began to mix them so that policymakers wouldn't know what they were really funding unless they really look carefully at the documentation. And there's never any keys. There's never any real definitions in these documents. So there's that. Electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic frequencies are frequencies, but it's the radiation we're talking about. So I never use the terms RF. That's radio frequency. It's just one chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you'll see this is another tactic with people who are unfamiliar with this really complicated topic, how are they supposed to follow all this if the utilities and the telecoms are moving from milligauss to volts to kilovolts to this to that? I mean, you literally have to learn all the technologies from the, those based on electromagnetic radiation, to the power lines, which are electrical frequencies. You have to learn to sort those out as to what they're actually talking about, or they can take you down that rabbit hole um, I like to focus on one frequency when I'm talking about 5G. It's my blog handle, 60 gigahertz. 60 gigahertz is a very dangerous frequency. It's a, it's a utility favorite. They've got whole product lines built around it. 60 gigahertz will actually excite the oxygen molecules, their electron shells, so much that they can no longer be absorbed by red blood cells. So you can literally die if you're sitting in a 60 gigahertz frequency long enough. And there are theories that the 10,000 transmitters, 5G transmitters, that were activated in Wuhan, China, they think that those were sometimes pulsed at 60 gigahertz, robbing the people of oxygen and causing them to collapse in the streets. And that's where those videos came from. So 60 gigahertz is a favorite of the utilities and the telecoms because it alters the nature of oxygen as the frequencies and the radiation move through the air. It, literally erases the resistance. So it's a great frequency for transmission. The problem is it kills everything in its path. It takes away the oxygen. So that's a biggie. And there's something I always forget, and I didn't put it on your sheets. You have copies of all this. Um, can I? Oh, your time is up. OK. Thank you. Well, good luck reading it. If you have any questions, call me. OK, thank you. All right, um, that's everyone that signed up. We appreciate everyone who came out this evening um, for public comment. Um, we have gone, I think we've gone an hour, maybe actually a little bit over. So um, appreciate everyone taking time to, to share their thoughts on the different issues. All right, the next item on the agenda 
is a public hearing on the FY25 budget. And so I think the county manager maybe has a few comments to make and then we'll open a public hearing for anyone who wants to comment on the proposed budget. We actually have the presentation and Donna's going to do the presentation tonight. Yes, it's okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's let this person also comment. Sorry about that. Bye. What's your name? I'm Molly Ann Bell. All right, sorry about that if I missed it somehow. Yeah. Um, I won't take long. Thank you very much. I um, am a teacher at Francine Delaney and also here to speak about um, our nursing situation. I know you have hard budget decisions to make, um, but I'm asking that you reconsider funding for nurses in the public charter schools. We have students with chronic health issues as class teachers, classroom teachers, myself and my colleagues are attending to those needs daily and sometimes even hourly. And I see my colleagues, and I have felt this myself, worried about how to care for a child. It's our nurse that helps us understand and follow those medical protocols. Our nurse is the liaison with our medical with medical professionals, um, and not funding the nurse puts the onus on the teachers, um, or the onus of responsibility on the teachers. Looking at the health needs of our school, I firmly believe that our nurse is keeping students in school and attending class. As teachers who are running the schools, we're always trying to be on the right side of ethical decisions. And this year, when a medical emergency happened in my classroom, I had um, a few decisions to make, and it was speaking to our nurse. Um, and she helped inform me um, and make decisions afterwards. And I feel like I was on the right side of ethics in that situation, and I appreciate her for that. Your decision impacts over 1,000 public school students and we're a public charter school, and we value all of our children. And lastly, with this decision, we won't always know what we prevent, but you will have to have faith that you're preventing crises from happening. So thank you. Thank you. And again, sorry for overlooking your name. All right, um, back to the public hearing on the budget. John Flitter, thanks for being here. <clears throat> Good evening. Commissioners, we are here tonight for a public hearing on the recommended budget for fiscal year 2025. This is the last step in our budget process before adoption. As we have moved through budget planning this year, we have seen a reduction of $7.6 million in revenue between reduced sales tax receipts and intergovernmental revenue that was used to fund county operations in fiscal year 24. While intergovernmental revenue has decreased, we're still mandated to provide services that were funded by that revenue to include Medicaid and some public health services. Last year, we increased K-12 education funding by $16 million and increased the tax rate by one penny, generating only $5 million in revenue to balance. As we cannot reduce the local current expense in a given year, this is an $11 million expenditure in the fiscal year 25 budget with no revenue offset. Other increased expenditures we cannot avoid this year include an additional $1.9 million in debt payments, an additional $1.9 million in retirement costs for employees passed on by the state, and an increase of about $1 million in expenditures related to our quadrennial property revaluation process and the presidential election. These factors create a $23.4 million impact to the fiscal year 25 county budget. In order to accommodate these factors and recommend a balanced budget per state statute, we have responded with the continuation of services budget. We asked departments for $7.5 million in operating request cuts, and we did not fund expansions this year. This has resulted in a department operating budget that is $3.7 million less than the fiscal year 24 amended budget. We have reduced our salary budget by $10 million to account for projected turnover and vacancies. We deferred $1.9 million of capital PAYGO projects to future years. We deferred 
contribution to our post-employment benefits fund this year, reducing expenditures another $1.9 million. We reevaluated remaining ARPA funds and we'll use $1.4 million to purchase ambulance and safety equipment for emergency services. We will implement a leasing model for general government vehicles instead of purchasing, saving an additional $700,000 in year one. This budget has $430.1 million of revenue with the three largest sources being 65% property tax, 11% intergovernmental revenues, and 11% sales tax. Our budget is appropriated by function. The largest function is education at 28%. This is followed by human services at 22%, public safety at 21%, general government at 16%, debt at 5%, cultural and recreational 3%, economic and physical development 2%, and other financing sources, 3%. This brings us to the fiscal year 25 recommended general fund budget of $441,905,358 with the tax rate recommended to increase 2.55 cents to 52.35 cents per $100 of assessed value. This budget recommends a 1.8% property tax value increase of the 2.55 cents to fund county operations and 0.75 cents to fund an increase for K-12 schools. This tax increase would add $102 annually or $8.50 monthly to the tax bill of a home valued at $400,000. Furthermore, this would require an appropriation of $11.8 million of fund balance to balance the budget per state statute. We are funding education at $126.2 million. This budget calls for increasing education funding to our partners by 3.52%. This is a $4.3 million increase over the fiscal year 24 amended budget. AB Tech did inform us at their budget request meeting that they were going out for bid on their janitorial service and believe that they would need an additional $300,000 above this allocation. They have since confirmed that number, though this is not represented in the recommended budget. 33 new positions are recommended, 30 in the general fund and three in the self-sustaining solid waste enterprise fund. 12 of these positions have offsetting revenue or reductions in contract costs to support the addition of the positions. Eight of these positions are headcount only with no budget attached. The other 10 positions are recommended to support existing service demand. This budget recommends a cost of living adjustment for county employees using the calculation of the personnel ordinance of the two year average of the consumer price index calculated at 4.89%. 13 capital projects are recommended a total of $26.1 million. 10 of these projects will be slated for debt at $25.1 million. None of these projects will have a financial impact on the general fund in fiscal year 25 and will only be reflected in debt payments once we have gone out to debt in a future issuance for these projects as they begin work. And the remaining three projects will be paid for with a PAYGO transfer and other fund savings. Community grant investments are budgeted at $10.7 million with $3.9 million going to early childhood education and $2.3 million going to affordable housing support. These investments primarily support local nonprofit organizations to promote health, safety, education, and well being in our community in alignment with our strategic priorities. The fiscal year 25 recommend budget recommends two tax increases for fire districts Fairview from 14.5 to 16 cents, and North Buncombe from 10.77 to 12.27 cents per $100 of assessed value. The total of all annual funds in the fiscal year 2025 recommended budget is $629,578,645. Posted with this evening's agenda are the fiscal year 2025 recommended budget in brief, 
the fiscal year 2025 fee schedule, the fiscal year 2025 classification and compensation plan, and the link to the, the interactive budget explorer. The next step is to conduct a public hearing on the budget, address any needed changes, and we will return in two weeks for budget adoption. Additionally, we also have the economic development hearing, and these are the routine appropriations as well as previous economic development agreements for this budget. All right, thank you, John. Let's go ahead and um, open the public hearing at 6.50 p.m. Are there any members of the public who wish to uh, speak regarding the proposed FY25 budget? <clears throat> All right, if not, I'm going to close the public hearing at 6.51 p.m. Uh, commissioners, so tonight's the night we have the public hearing, so we'll be taking up uh, consideration of the budget at our next meeting. All right. Um, thanks, John. Okay. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda under old business is determination of a critical need for capital improvement project. And I think Tim Love is speaking to this item, or Michael Frith. I drew the short straw today. Um, Michael Frew here for this item. Mr. Chairman, commissioners, uh, you've heard several times from uh, Tim Love and uh, Sarah Odio from DFI at the School of Government regarding uh, plans and proposals for development of the uh, ferry road site. Uh, DFI very recently put together a very detailed uh, instruction and presentation for to get to solicit bids for development partners on that site. We've also heard recently about several different options for funding development and how that would proceed. What staff would like to do would be to convert what DFI has put out there uh, into, into a possible public-private partnership. So the information with the DFI's proposal fulfills any notification requirements that this board would put out to request solicitations for such a public-private development. And we just need to have this board approve this resolution, which would formally and in writing indicate that there's a critical need for capital improvements in the form of affordable housing in the community. Uh, we've studied that many times. We know that to be true. This is just a formal step to make that in writing and make that formal. Then we'll put an ad into the newspaper, and then we can uh, fully vet the possibility of working toward that solution. So we just ask that the board approve this uh, resolution for those purposes. <clears throat> Thank you. Commissioners, any questions, or is there a motion? Move to adopt the proposed resolution. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, Michael. All right. The next item under new business is consideration of budget amendments for conservation easements. Hello, commissioners. Um, I'm Jill Carter. I'm the Open Space Bond Project Manager. And I'm just here tonight to introduce Ariel Zeip from our Farmland Preservation Program. Um, she's going to be introducing <coughs> Okeechobee, a farm conservation easement. Uh, if approved, this will be the third conservation easement project to be funded using Open Space Bond funds, um, bringing us to a <coughs> total of $12.8 million um, allocated from the Open Space Bond. All right, good evening, Chair and Commissioners. All right, so today I'm here to talk about the Okobochi Farm Conservation Easement. Um, just a, a bit of a um, reminder uh, on our open space bond uh, conservation easement purchase requirements. Um, the Okobochi uh, Conservation Easement meets um, five of these uh, requirements where um, the only requirement really is for it to meet at least two. So it's within one of our conservation um, focus, focus areas. Um, it's also in proximity to other protected lands. We have uh, significant prime soils on the property um, and significant importance as well it's, as it is a working farm. 
Here's a map showing um, the bottom lands on this property. It's around 42 acres off of Lower Brush uh, Creek Road. Uh, we have 92% prime soils on this property, so that is, that's a really high percentage of prime soils um, in our mountains. It's not quite as common to see that on one tract, so um, that, that makes this parcel a very uh, special one to protect. Like I mentioned before, it is in one of our Buncombe County conservation focus areas, um, as identified in our comprehensive plan. Mm -hmm. Um, it has significant viewshed protection. A lot of the community members out in Fairview uh, bike and run and walk along this road as well as drive it. Um, it is contiguous to other, um, sorry, it's proximal to other protected lands, um, creating a lot more impact with the conservation of this property. It is an active working farm. Um, Hickory Nut Gap Farm currently leases this property, um, which is one of, as many know, one of our largest regener regenerative agricultural operations in the county. Uh, we have significant water quality benefits with this property. Um, Cane Creek is running through the property. Um, and we have recently, uh, the, the, um, that whole stretch of Cane Creek has recently um, completed some stream restoration work. Uh, so that's another significant impact. And this conservation easement would be held by Buncombe County Soil and Water and our farmland preservation program. This map shows um, the uh, proximity to other protected lands within that Fairview community. And then here is our overview of the funding uh, for this conservation easement. So we came back um, uh, in the fall and requested transaction costs to start this project. Um, so that was previously funded from uh, fiscal year 24 budget. Um, we have uh, submitted and applied for USDA funding for this uh, conservation easement. So um, this past year, uh, there was a record number of applications submitted um, for USDA funding with a very small allocation statewide. So this project, while it ranked competitively, did not get selected for funding because um, the federal um, allocation of funding for easements was small this year. So our request um, to, the, to the Open Space Bond is to um, request for 50% easement purchase, which would be um, $511,500. Um, and that would also uh, show a landowner donation of 50% of the easement value as well. Um, so that is essentially the overview of, of the budget request. Um, and um, I'm going to Welcome Jess Lagus, the Farmland Protection Director uh, from Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy to um, make a, another presentation, not from the Open Space Bond Funds, but for a conservation easement to be funded from the Special Program Easement Funds. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm excited to be here before you this afternoon. Um, as Ariel mentioned, this project is not for bond funds. This is the regular uh, appropriated funds for conservation easement transaction cost funds. Um, we are very excited to, that Warren Wilson College has voted, their Board of Trustees has voted unanimously to protect 600 acres of their 1,000 acre um, campus through four conservation easements with Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy. So I just want to, um, forewarn you that these costs are actually for four separate easements um, in order that we can um, apply each of these easements would be able to transfer separately in the future. So the, this was an intentional design, though it will cause a lot of additional administrative effort. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the campus is stunning. It's 600 acres that will be protected through four separate easements encumbering farm and forest land. Um, you can see in this context map, this uh, the properties actually adjoin SHC's, uh, an SHC held conservation easement that we call Chemtronics in the um, Swannanoa Valley. And it also adjoins Owen Park. There are public hiking trails in Owen Park that connect through into Warren Wilson that the college makes available for public use. Um, we have a GIS modeling practice to help us uh, identify what the most critical lands for conservation are. 
we have two models. One is for um, what we call mountain land conservation, not working lands. And then we have a separate model for agricultural lands because agricultural conservation is more, those conservation values are more defined by soils, openness, and their potential agricultural productivity. Um, it's extremely rare for us to see a project rank both as top priorities in our farmland model as well as our mountain lands model. And Warren Wilson does that. Um, let's see. The campus is really defined sort of the, dri the experience driving along Warren Wilson Road and uh, Old Farm School Road and Riceville Road. If anyone's traveled those roads, this, um, it's extremely scenic and the campus anchors all of that um, bottomlands in, in the Swannanoa Valley. The campus, in addition to having the hiking trails open to the public, has a working farm with a recently added farm general store that's open to the public. They also run a tailgate market and um, sell both their student wares as well as um, produce, from, produce and meats and dairy from the farm in those outlets. Um, additionally, there's a pub, uh, clearly an educational component. Um, Warren Wilson is a working college where the students um, make up the workforce for the campus. There's a, there is a farm crew as well as a garden crew, fiber arts crew, multiple crews that run the campus, but um, at the same time are gaining important skills and becoming the next generation of conservationists, of foresters, and of agriculturalists in the community and beyond. Um, the campus is really a leader. The college is a leader in um, innovative agricultural uh, methods as well as non-timber agroforestry. Um, Dave Ellum, the dean of lands on campus, describes the campus as a living laboratory for their students, but they also have an intention of being sort of a, a proof of concept for various innovative production methods that they can afford to risk, whereas some of where our mountain farmers don't have to take on those financial burdens. Um, let's see. Yes, this easement would be held by Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy. Um, this is an image showing the four different easements as well as the unencumbered land highlighted in gray. There's a potential that there would be a phase two on uh, the undeveloped portion of gray land that the college calls Berea. Um, but currently this project would encumber the, the colorful tracts. Um, the encumbered land would make is 69% important soils. Um, that's slightly deceptively low given that Jones Mountain, the um, southernmost portion, is entirely mountainous and doesn't have as great of soil contents um, but we're able to protect that mountain land through the agricultural easements. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so Warren Wilson College has garnered many accolades um, for their programs and for their sustainability initiatives. Um, this e these easements really are uh, in line with their ethos, in line with their goals for uh, financial stability over the coming years. Um, and I think will help, they have a goal also of using this as further leverage for um, continued fundraising in an attempt to uh, make their financial status a little more sustainable. Um, many liberal arts colleges are struggling across the country and I think this is a really innovative approach to try and um, create some sustainability both financially and um, in terms of conservation. The uh, total easement value is estimated at $7,800,000. Um, this is extremely valuable land in close proximity to Asheville, extremely developable land, developable land with um, nearby uh, examples of conversion to um, low density housing development. Um, we intend to maximize every potential funding source for these funds. We'll be reaching out for federal dollars for state grants, um, for bond funding uh, in the future, we'll be coming back with requests for funding from the bond, and um, private donations. Um, I will note, Ariel had mentioned that our state allocation of federal funding is particularly low, given the volume of um, 
projects that North Carolina is able to complete, but Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy has spearheaded an, um, an allocation of federal funds specifically for the western portion of the state through a regional conservation partnership program uh, allocation of funds, which is not quite a grant, that set, sort of set aside a pot of funds that we believe will be um, available for this project. Um, the entire transaction costs are estimated at nearly $400,000, $393,000. Um, we'll be seeking $83,000 of that from private donations and fundraising. And we request um, $310,000 from the county for these transaction costs. These include four surveys, four appraisals, four title searches and commitments, um, and eventually policies. Um, phase one environmental site assessments, um, and represent only 3.7% of the total costs of this project. Um, and Ariel has very kindly added that that is, uh, this request is averages to $77,500 per easement because there are four separate easements going into place. Is this for both projects? <laughs> Thank you. So our request at this time uh, for board action would be um, to approve both budget amendments um, establishing these easements as projects. And please let us know if you have any questions on the specific projects. Well, I just want to share my excitement because having this amount of prime soils is extremely key for the future of farming in Buncombe County. So both of these projects are very exciting in that way, as well as all the other ways. And, you know, many of us for a long time have wanted to see Warren Wilson, this land conserved. So this is a very exciting day that we're moving forward with that. And I just also want to say I'm incredibly proud of our staff, the landowners, our conservation partners, both the advisory boards that have worked on these projects because our community is going to reap the benefits of this for quite some time. So thanks to all of you for your good work. Thank you very much. And I'll make a motion to approve both the budget, budget amendments. Second. Okay, and that was for the first, is that for one or two other projects? There was two budget amendments. Okay, so this is for the first. For the you want to do the first one? Yeah. Okay. For the Okaboji Farm. So that one, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly, Carrie. I was doing both. You were doing both. Okay. Doing both. All right. That's, I, that's all right. Sure. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second in support of the two uh, budget amendments for the two conservation projects outlined. Further discussion? Let me ask you a question now. <clears throat> Will this take care of the four, or is it just two, and you'll come back for two more? Are you specifically asking about the Warren Wilson College right. one? Yeah, so this request would be to fund the transaction costs for the four conservation okay. easements at Warren Wilson, but uh, Southern Appalachian plans to come back for easement purchase funding for the four conservation easements as well. How much well. will that be? Um, I think... Well, it's slightly under, I think we had it on the, slightly under $500,000. I don't know the exact figure, maybe like 483 <coughs> If we bring the presentation back up, it is on the presentation. I hope so. Um, it says that they'll come back and ask for funds from the open space bond for 483889 is what they're estimating yes, on that slide. Yes, so that would be coming back um, over the next year or two. Um, that, that is the hope. But we have that included in, in our financial projections for bond requests. Thank you. Okay, further discussion, more questions? Uh, I would also just like to comment. These are both great projects. The uh, the Warren Wilson project is just like, you know, a phenomenal accomplishment. It'll be looked at as like one of the most significant conservation projects in the county's history. I mean, I don't think that's overstating it at all. It's, it's, I mean, it's, um, 
I mean, it's one of the most iconic places in the county just in terms of just the natural beauty of it and the working landscape. So anyway, uh, just as Terry said, congratulations to everyone who helped get it to this point. There's more to do, but I'm really glad the county can be supportive of helping the transaction process move forward so this can get across the finish line. So great job. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank you, guys. All right. All right, the next item on the agenda is consideration of the proposed capital improvement policy. And Melissa Moore, our finance director, is here to present this item. So over the past several months, I've presented to you during budget retreats and budget workshops focused on fiscal sustainability and planning for a future as it relates to the county's capital needs. So many of the capital projects in our in capital improvement plan are results of the master plans and various assessments that come before you for adoption <clears throat> that lay out our long-term capital needs um, across our community. Our analysis also has um, come across more of a funding uh, um, focus on operations rather than um, toward capital investments. So as we look at the resu results of our recommendations, our research, and our long-term planning, the recommended policy changes to our capital improvement um, policy begins with defining our capital projects and establishing a process for adopting our capital improvement plan, a formal submission and review process to go before capital review team, to bring a seven-year capital improvement plan by fiscal year 26 before the Board of Commissioners for adoption. And also to establish an ongoing transfer from your general fund to create a reserves for your capital improvement plan to provide a, a dedicated funding source for our capital investments. So to look further into what that transfer to establish a capital reserves would be based on, the annual transfer is recommended to begin in fiscal year 26. The baseline for year one transfer would equate to 120% of your general fund debt service obligation. That transfer would grow at a compounded growth rate at a minimum of 2% up to your annual change in your consumer price index. So the table here at the bottom of the slide is just an illustration based on the current obligation for our debt service and then the calculation applying that growth rate to establish your capital reserves portion. The example put in for you on that table is an estimation at a 4% growth rate. Again, it would be based on the actual change in consumer price index or a minimum of 2%. So those are the changes that I recommend to adopt for your capital improvement policy. All right, thank you. Any commissioners, questions? It is great to have this in writing to show exactly um, how we're going to adopt and amend capital improvement plans going forward. Um, thanks for the hard work, Melissa. If there's no questions, then I will move to approve the policy as presented. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. Further discussion? Okay. I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. I've got a general concern, but you go, you go ahead. Okay. So, you know, we talked about this some at our, one of our budget planning meetings, right? So I'll, you know, and I expressed some of the questions and concerns there, so I'm probably gonna be repeating myself a little bit, but like, I mean, I certainly see value in this approach. Um, we have a lot of capital needs. 
that we already know about and we know that there will be more you know, really important projects that need to get funded in coming years. So, you know, I think that I think that the challenge to me from like question about whether or not uh, to adopt this specific policy that would sort of commit the county to setting these funds aside for this in this on this schedule and in these amounts is that in every given year we have all these really tough budget decisions to make, right? Like this year is probably the hardest budget year that I've sat through, you know, that, that I've faced since I've been on the county commission, but there's been, there's been other, they're always, they're always hard. There's always, like, there's always hard decisions to make. It's, it's a little bit, um, you know, easier when you have a budget surplus that you're looking at instead of, you know, a tight, a really tight year like this one. So, but what this policy would basically direct, you know, the commission to do in the future is to set, is to transfer these amounts of money from our general fund into this capital reserve account to be used for capital projects. And um, in each of these future years, of course, there's gonna be all these different competing demands. So we'd either, you know, adhere to this policy and do this, or if in a given year, it was determined like, wow, this is like, maybe we don't wanna raise taxes this year. And, and, you know, funding, transferring this amount of funding from our general fund into this capital fund might require a tax increase, right, to do that. Um, or there's other budget priorities that are just determined to be, you know, top priorities. So the concern is that the commission would have to basically kind of violate its policies that it would have adopted or, or you know, um, you know, kind of implement it as, as it's scheduled. So I guess, I guess I just question whether it makes sense for the county to kind of commit itself to sort of like this, this kind of specific policy as opposed to when we get into these future budget years, kind of look at what the capital project needs are, right? Like there'll be a list of projects brought to the commission and the staff will say, hey, here's what we see as like the top priorities. Here's others that would be great to do, but you know, maybe can wait a little while and deliberate about the amount of capital funding to invest either on a pay-go basis or to borrow money to fund those capital needs, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of different things that we look at and we think, gosh, you know, this is really important to do. I mean, taking care of your capital needs is certainly a really important thing to do. You know, but I think about like we have a policy, but we don't really have a policy around like cost of living adjustments, right? Like we want to do it, but we also look at it every year. And in this year, you know, like we've talked about it a lot because it's a really tough budget year and inflation and cost of living has gone way up. So it's a much bigger than normal number this year and last year, right? We could have a policy that would say, that would say you know what, we should, first thing we should do is we should take cost of living adjustments, right? Like we should do that. That's not a raise. That's just kind of keeping everyone where they're at with cost of living and what they're paid. I think there's a really strong case for it. I think there's also a pretty good case for having some flexibility during really tough years, right? To be able to, you know, um, make, a, make, a, make a different decision on a, in a specific case. So I guess, I guess I'm just sort of raising these concerns from a budget planning standpoint. It's not that I don't believe we need to be planning to invest more in capital needs. I think we certainly will need to invest more. But those are those are the concerns I would raise. I mean, I would ask like, if this is if this is um, really a good idea, why why didn't we adopt it for this budget year, right? We talked about that earlier, and then I think we started seeing like, wow, this is going to be a really hard budget year. So let's don't do this this year. Let's wait till next year to do this, because I think we all know if we were doing this this year, we would have to. We're already looking at probably to some extent, you know, like a recommended property tax increase. If we'd adopted this policy last year, there would be like a whole nother one cent tax increase layered on top of the ex tax increase that we're already facing to implement this policy. If we, had, if we had done this 12 months ago, that's the situation we would be in today. I hope we're in a better, I hope we're in a better economic moment a year from now than we are today, but we don't know that. We know there's gonna be a reval, there's gonna be you know, all the issues that go along with that, there'll be numerous budget pressures on it. So, I, anyway, I, I, I do see value in this. So, 
I'm not necessarily against investing these amounts into future capital projects, but I do, I do wonder if adopting a formal policy that we that would commit us to that um, is is the right approach. So, just wanted to kind of air those that perspective. Um, could I ask what, yeah, what would be the difference between adopting this as a policy versus generally having it as guidance for kind of that same concern? I mean, if we're talking about philosophy and how nimble we want to remain in various economic circumstances, can someone share with me some thoughts on? Because I mean, it seems like a good idea that we, but I, I don't see that we'd have to bind ourselves to it as much as year by year discretion. You know, when I look at this as policy, I see it as I look at it maybe from the other side. Of it. You know, I know when I was working with major businesses, you know, <laughs> uh, we would look at this as positive when they had this policy because we're not going to have any surprises. One of the things we know, and I understand where you're coming from, Brown, but we know we're going to have capital needs. And when we have a policy, this, I think, would prepare us better for the future, where we'd have it there, because we know we're going to need it, rather than, I'd rather see us with a pot of money that we can use, rather than not. Say, if we had put this in place 10 years ago, would we be having the problems we're having today? Because we wouldn't have to, you know, maybe at this point, we could uh, have the money there to take care of the capital versus how much are we going to spend this year for capital improvement. The debt service payments were over $19 million. Yeah. And we've deferred PAYGO for next year yeah. to reduce that. But, you know, it, it, work, it can work the other way too. And really, if we have the policy and we run up against a brick wall, we can always change it, right? In their policies, that's true. So I have a question, just on some specifics. So with the, <clears throat> when you say adopt the seven-year CIP, so beyond, previously it was five years that we'd look at it. Is that the only difference with those two items or? So just the difference between five and seven years, or is there anything else difference around the CIP process in this proposal? No, we're just asking to add two more years to that long term. Yeah, to add okay. five or seven. Yes. But yeah. yeah. And um, I'm sorry, the other piece is, I don't think you have officially adopted a CIP policy in the past. We present it, we discuss it, but it's never been adopted. That's so, what I wondered. So too. the piece that we're asking for, to your point, yes. This two things, make so it, it a seven-year plan and adopt it. Okay, so that is a difference yes, overall. I, d I do still have some questions about this, actually. I, w I, w I wish we'd had some more time for questions and thinking about it with this, because I do have just a few more things to the kind of way with that, because in the past, right, we're just doing that capital plan each year, but you're wanting us to adopt a seven-year plan then, specifically. That was the ask, but every year the five-year plan, it's, it's there and we can add or we update mm -hmm. the numbers based on inflation or whatever the new estimates are on the cost. But the, the big projects are still on that plan. So even though you're talking about it annually, we still have, we know what's on that plan for five years right now. We actually have more than five years. We only take five-year chunks. Mm -hmm. We can keep it at five, or we can extend it to seven. We were hoping to extend it so you have a longer perspective to look at this. One of the reasons, to Brownie's point of, um, yes, we would have a plan that we use this gu as guidance. We can always add a section in there to flexibility. If you may recall, on our, on our fund balance policy, we built in some flexibility so that if we ever did go below that 15% floor, we have a chance to rebuild it and have a plan to do so. We can put some language in this policy to also give you a flexibility, but this is your policy, so you can always amend your policy should you get to Al's point in a brick wall. Also remember that for some of the largest investments that we do have to make, which is our AV tech facilities, there is a funding source for that. For our schools facility, there's a funding source for that. 
we do not have a funding source now for county properties. And so we have a lot of county properties that need that attention. And this is the intent here is we have a lot of capital projects on the horizon, whether that's, and we have a lot of assessments and studies as well that we've invested in. One of those being our emergency services, we know we have a need there. So we have to talk about that. We know we have a need for county buildings as well. Um, so as you think about those things that we have to talk about, this is a way that we can start thinking about how do we address those needs in the future. Well, speaking to what you said about flexibility, I would prefer that you bring it back to us with that wording around the flexibility for us to be able to look at that and take it into consideration. I guess um, what I'm thinking about is thinking about our last budget retreat, which I think was the the best budget retreat I've, I've experienced, in, and in large part because it showed multi-year, a multi-year funding plan for capital infrastructure, um, which I support wholeheartedly. I think there's a lot of county infrastructure like emergency services, physical infrastructure that we should have built decades ago um, as a community, but but didn't. And so, I, so I really see the value in thinking about this holistically and thinking about it over years. Um, I, I, I do, I guess I, I do want to hear, I guess, more, more thoughts behind and more of an argument around the necessity of and the virtue of a, a kind of specific written policy of, of doing this kind of the same way every year. Because um, it, it does kind of, not officially, but indirectly tie, you know, tie our hands to something when we might have weird budget years, I guess, is, is my concern. Can please this if you want please I do I so from from a planning perspective from budget and finance and cash management having this policy allows us to enter into those planning um, phases where departments are making their requests and for us to set kind of a funding um, ceiling if you will so we base that on capacity to issue debt meaning our ability to and raise enough revenue to pay that debt service as a result of issuing new debt, but as well as taking removing that dependency on 98% of our capital plan being funded by debt. So the, the, the more that we incorporate what we're seeing in our long range plan of the capital the, and the cash that we need to generate, if, if we adopt this now and we start out with this gradual progression to we're generating that reserve, then years down the road, we won't be issuing debt. And all I can assume is that potentially interest rates may go up. I don't think we're gonna see the glory days of 2% interest for a while, right? So when, when you have those interest rates and now we've entered this interest rate environment that it costs us more, that means we have to generate more revenue to pay that debt service. <coughs> So instead of paying $1 into a, in, into a capital project, we're having to spend like $1.40. And that's generation of revenue. And Chairman, you, you mentioned a tax rate management aspect. We're going to continue to see really tough budget years if we don't put policies like this in place to plan for our future. So they can either get tougher or we can start putting things in, absolutely could put some flexibility in place to allow that. But we've got a plan for the future or we're going to continue to have to defer capital or to um, increase our debt service, our debt obligation to deliver these. And they're going to be at a higher cost because you have all of that cost of capital that comes with that. So we can, we can start now and gradually build toward converting more of our capital plan to being cash funded, which generates, requires less a lower amount of revenue to cover those costs, which is in hand in cash in cash management as well as tax rate management. Thank you for that explanation. I think the timing of this is really interesting. After our strategic plan session earlier today where we were discussing multi-year budgeting, um, particularly in regards to education funding. And so I feel like looking at this and moving forward, um, is a very fiscally responsible move for us to be making, particularly in light of that conversation that we had earlier. And in regards to, you know, what happens a couple years down the road when we need to revisit this, um, I mean, 
we have policies in place about growth rate for education funding, and we, in some years, chosen to, for all practical purposes, ignore what that policy is. Um, so I do appreciate having a policy in place for our fiscal decisions um, is where I'll leave that. So I'm still in support of this. I think being able to plan and better plan particularly since we don't have a dedicated revenue source for our capital projects and knowing that the need for capital projects across the county is going to continue to grow. I think this is the step in the right direction. Thank you, Melissa. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? I do just have one other question about this. So is it, isn't it correct that um, like for the first few years that the, like if we follow the schedule that's on here, so $4 million the first year, then 4.6, then 5.2 uh, transferred, those funds won't actually be invested into capital projects in those years. The idea is to like sort of build up the fund and then you'll have this sort of larger fund to like invest in capital projects years into the future. Is that right? right? It's our recommendation that we at least at minimum allow it to accumulate for years before we basically use those funds toward our capital plan. So like in the first one, two, three years, aren't there gonna be a lot of other capital projects though that need to be implemented in those years that the staff would recommend not borrowing debt for but using cash to pay for? There will be additional pay recommended projects that are appropriate for pay for cash funding for pay for. That's true. Okay. And but what is could you just talk a little bit more about the rationale for like building up like twelve or thirteen million dollars into this fund rather than saying like, hey, we've got this, you know, we've got this list of projects. We need to do them. Like let's let's you know, let's do this, let's do this list of projects. Like let's put these dollars to work build, acquiring this equipment or building these you know projects. Like what's the, I guess I, I pitch the idea that we need to like build up this fund as opposed to like, hey, we need to we need to have a good list of projects and we need to like work our way through it and like stay on top of it but spend the dollars. Like, what's the rationale for sort of setting the dollars aside and building up a fund? By allowing the funds to accumulate and build, it gives us a, a planning target to accomplish more with, with larger amounts, right? As we see the needs that are in the long range plan that are on the, on the capital plan as a result of some of these master plans and assessments, we see components that would be appropriate for and more than what just one year of the four million would be able to accomplish. And so we see those areas, it gives us flexibility, and that flexibility, it gives you options. So when you have cash and you have options to make those decisions, you're not forced to do other things when you don't have options, right? So having options and depending on where um, interest rates go, whether they're, you've got opportunity to have a, a better interest earning on it, or interest and rates continue to stay high. We don't know, so allowing it to grow gives us options and we're able to better serve um, the community by managing our, our funds to the best of our ability given wherever the economy takes us. Thank you. And you know, how would that affect when the rates are down? Would that give us more to pay as we go? When the interest rates are low, that's where you getting locked into a 20-year rate by a debt issuance. It's probably not that bad of an idea, right. although you still don't want it to be dependent because you still have that cost of capital. And it's significant when you're issuing large amounts, 10, 15, 20, 80 million, however much you, you accumulate for the um, various projects. And there's, so there's times where right now we're earning um, almost like five and a quarter percent interest. So we're allowing some of those idle funds that we're not actually paying invoices against to earn that interest. Whereas the issuing debt is a little bit more expensive this year than it was a few years ago. So fast forward a few years from now, having options to whether we retain that cash or it's a better, it's a good environment to enter into a 20 year commitment and locking into rates. And again, it would give us options. All right. Any other questions or thoughts on this? We do have a motion second. I just had a quick question. Um, I know we can't fully predict the, what will happen with interest rates and other, other parts of the market, but as we look at the five or seven year plan, 
are there projects where you see the ability to deploy large sums would be particularly strategic? Is that part of what's driving this, that there's specific utilizations for large sums um, that are in mind, or is it more sort of a general principle that you'd like to build the reserves? It's a little bit of both. We, we see the results of these um, the facility assessments, the emergency management assessment, and we see some of those to where those really large projects like building a new EMS um, base, those are very appropriate um, for larger debt um, issuance. But some of the sm other smaller projects, it would be different if we only had one or two, but we don't. And they're, the smaller projects that are a million, maybe less than a million, they accumulate. Right, so as we see those, instead of saying, well, we can't do those because we have this larger project, we have options to be able to continue to stay on track when, when the renovations or um, doing things to your parks or thing are needed for the community. We have the option to go ahead, instead of continuing to defer those, <coughs> to, to strategically plan on what year it makes sense to kind of level out some of the peaks and to fill those in. And so you just, you have um, a combination. So just a question. Oh, so is there a sense that we want some flexibility in it? I'm kind of not sure where folks are. <laughs> like, is there a sense that we want some flexibility in the policy? Because that it seems like I've heard some folks say that, but I'm not sure, because I know there was a motion and a second. So I just wanted to check to see, do we need to amend the motion to have that flexibility writ written into the policy? If you want us to take it back to Toby's point and take a look at it, or if it is something that you don't want to do, we want to hear that. But if it's something, when we left the last meeting on this, we thought we were bringing back something for your consideration. So if you want us to go back and take a look at flexibility or any other process, any other um, comments in the policy, we'll love to do that and return it back for your consideration. If the idea of flexibility sparks an idea in Avril's mind, I'd be interested in hearing it. I'm supportive of y'all coming back with that, taking a look at it and making some adjustments. Thank you. John's point that in a year where we're facing the likely scenario of competition, do you feel that the Jones policy would be related to the current competition situation? So I just wonder if that maybe could be factored in as well into your kind of more immediate plan for the next mm -hmm. year. Yes, and, and we can talk about a pause similar to what we did this year with um, other post-employment benefits. We can look to see what that language could look like. Okay. What was it? I mean, y'all made the motion, so I wouldn't want to. Y'all, y'all want to hear more? Said we can always change it, right? Absolutely, you can always be like, "Yeah, it's our policy, yeah. and we're not doing it this year, right?" Yeah. <laughs> so, you, you it, we. I mean, I think if we did it, what you would probably be, we were sort of asking us to actually just include some language in here saying this is the um, what the county considers to be a good path forward, but can take into consideration the specific budget circumstances to make modifications if needed. Something like that, just so that's written in here so you don't have to I like feel that. like we're, gosh, we're breaking our policy if we don't do it exactly like this in a given circumstance. So it would just be some simple language. Is that what you're thinking of, Avril? Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 So we, we y'all can bring that back system. and maybe we could just, um, be on the consent agenda just to sort of talk about it through. Um, I mean, I got, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, and I think, I think, you know. Um, I think I need to withdraw you the motion. You have to withdraw or amend. Yeah, you do, right. Okay. Yeah. You're withdrawing I, it. I withdraw the motion. I withdraw the motion. Okay. Bring it back with that. A little bit of additional language for flexibility. Did I hear you say put it in consent? It's a bit, it is, it is, it, let's, it is, it is an important policy. I mean, it really is a significant policy. I mean, I, 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 when I think about it, like, it basically means, if we're going to do this and stick with it, it basically means the county is going to need to, like, raise the tax rate by one penny to fund this, because it's about a penny on the tax rate. Once you put it in place, you keep it, right? 
But that's basically what this means, right, from a practical standpoint. And if we adopt it and we put it in place next year, that's what the county would, would do. And then you'd have this one, you know, kind of roughly one cent dedicated funding source to fund, you know, these capital needs in the future. So there's a good, arg there's a good argument for it. I guess I would just also say, besides this flexibility issue, the other part that I just, you know, personally haven't been completely persuaded by is that I just feel like one of the advantages of, you know, having a AAA rated county government is that we can, you know, yeah, you have to pay interest when you borrow money, of course you do, but we can borrow capital at like the lowest cost of like any one in the country, right? It's one of like the really great inherent advantages of local government. Like there's a lot of things like businesses can do better and like individuals can do better, but like one of the things we are able to do because it is a very trustworthy organization is like we are able to access capital, very low cost. So I do also just question whether or not it makes sense to kind of commit ourselves to funding like this percentage of the future capital needs with like cash on hand versus simply borrowing the money. Yeah, yeah, you have to pay interest on it, but you're also able to pay for the investments over the useful life of the equipment, right? So I just, I think it's, I mean, maybe there's certain places where if we were over borrowing, like our lenders would say, hey, y'all have taken on too much debt and you can't keep doing that or it's gonna cost more. But as far as everything I've heard, like we're nowhere near any of those limits. And so why pay for capital with cash on hand? I just, I guess I just don't completely embrace the idea that this percentage, I mean, some of it should be cash, I agree, but that this percentage of it is like the landing in the right place. So. How would the rating agencies look at this? Some of the focused questions that we've received from the three rating agencies that rated us for our most recent bond issuances were very focused on the um, appropriation of fund balance and the future years of continuing to rely on and draw down on our fund balance. So this would go into the same metric and calculation as a reserve. And so they, they look very favorably upon it, but not only do they look favorably, to be AAA rated, the metrics that they, they calculate, you're at a higher standard. And so should we build our reserves, that metric, which does not calculate to a AAA standard. It's one of our metrics that is lower than a AAA standard. So by building that and contributing more that goes into that calculation, whether it's the fund balance from the general fund side or this additional reserve, it would continue to support that um, on the, the AAA rating metric side. <clears throat> all right, that's all I got. So. <laughs> all right, good conversation. Thank you for bringing this forward. It'll be back with some additional language. We'll act on it. Okay, commissioners, we have some board appointments to look at. Health and Human Services. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Community Child Protection Team. I move that we appoint um, Jordan Gonzalez. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Adult Care Home Community Advisory Committee. I move that we appoint Mark Feldman. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Planning board, we have three reappointments. I'll make the motion to reappoint John Knorr, Anthony Coxey, and Michael Fisher. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? TBA, one reappointment. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, Strategic Partnership Grants Committee. We have one appointment for this. There are several folks that have applied. So questions are, do we want to appoint one of these folks from the list? Do we want to 
interview. So I th that's the. I think on this one we have traditionally interviewed because they're making funding decisions and recommending them on our behalf. So mm -hmm. I would prefer to stay with how we have handled this previously and schedule interviews. I'll echo that. Um, but out of curiosity, when would we interview? Unless someone's really excited for a budget meeting. Uh, um, well, we have our next meeting, and then we're not meeting the first week in July. But maybe there's not, so we could look it up in the, at the next meeting. Um, we don't, the Affordable Housing Committee does not meet prior to that meeting, so I think the members on that committee could potentially be available earlier in the day. Do y'all want to look at that afternoon, like at 3.30 or 4 or something? Two before weeks from today? What am I thinking? Um, before the briefing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, right, right. Like 2 o'clock two or thereabouts. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. I can't make that, but if everyone else can, don't schedule around me. It works for me. Two weeks. The next meeting won't be until the third week in July that we're all gonna naturally be here. Of June, two weeks from today. All right, I think we're gonna shoot for that. So two o'clock or we need a little bit more time, you know, right before then, but um, right around two o'clock it'll start. So, as we did last time, right? Yeah. All right. We'll do it. All right. Um, commissioners, are there any uh, updates from county commission boards? Very brief one, if y'all don't mind. Um, we had. Really productive year for early childhood. Um, thank our exiting committee members um, for their service. Uh, and also just wanted to use this for the many people that are watching right now, I'm sure, um, to advertise for the business community or economic development professional spot, the community at large spot, funder or community investment professional spot, professor or early childhood, early higher education professional, pediatrician or medical professional um, openings with the board. We really need to fill those spots. We come too dangerously co close to quorum, so please find that online and join us. Yeah. All right. Any others? All right, we have a couple of announcements. On June 18th at 3 p.m., the county commissioners will hold their briefing meeting at 200 College Street, room uh, on the, I'm supposed to say on the third floor, right? It says first floor on the, Packet, but we'll be back on the we'll be back on the third floor. June eighteenth at five p.m. The county commissioners will hold a regular meeting at two hundred College Street, room three two six in downtown Asheville. Is there a need for a closed session, Mr. Frew? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned.